Thank you, Kylie. Uh, thank you, uh, Tim. Uh, you all didn't have the same vantage point that I did, but as Tim was singing, I looked down at this sweet angelic face sitting here who was looking adoringly at her papa while he sang. And I thought that is one blessed child because given what we know about Tim now and what we know about Darla, and we hear there's some others, there are some good musical genes in that family. <laughs> and she's got a bright future musically, I believe. Does anybody have a question this morning? One of our dogs, we're, we're dog people, we have three dogs. One of our dogs, her name is Honey, uh, frequently lies on her back with one arm sticking straight up in the air like this. And when our granddaughter Olivia was younger, she used to say, Honey has a question. <laughs> <coughs> Children have lots of questions. We adults too often get impatient with children's questions. We, we say because they ask them over and over again the same question. When are we just going to get there? Why? Why? But sometimes it's because uh, we get frustrated because we don't want to ad admit that we don't have an answer to their question or we don't want to deal with the issue that their honest question raises. Daddy, is it a sin to drive 45 in a 25 mile an hour zone? <laughs> there are many kinds of questions in this world. There are leading questions to which we try to get a prescribed answer. Every married man here knows about those questions. <laughs> Honey, does this dress make my behind look big? You know what the answer to that question is, don't you? There are loaded questions which try to put the one who answers in a no-win trap. The Pharisees were all the time trying to get Jesus with those kinds of questions. Despite what we say, there are dumb questions which don't seem to have any other purpose than a way for the questioner to be heard. There are some people who seem to have an affinity for the sound of their own voice, and they use questions as a way to hear it. There are irrelevant or inane questions which sometimes serve as a way to distract others or avoid something. There are test questions for the purpose of discerning how much we know. There are nosy, gossipy questions for the purpose of discerning how much we know. There are questions which really are not questions at all, but a way for the one asking to express an opinion without having to claim or own that opinion. There are all kinds of questions in this world. Every once in a while, we come across a truly profound, and life-changing question. Will you marry me? Wow, that's a big question, isn't it? Can you do this job? What's the diagnosis? Are you pregnant? Are you being honest? What do you believe? Life is such that oftentimes our entire destiny seems to hinge upon just one or two simple three or four word questions. No question is more profound, though, than the one Jesus asks in our scripture passage from Matthew this morning. What question would that be? Before we say for sure, let's look at the questions we find in this passage. The first question Jesus asks is one that we pretend oftentimes is not important to us, but in reality it is. Who do others say that I am? What do other people think? 
I hear folks say all the time, well, I don't care one bit what others think. Well, I'll admit right up front, I care what others think. I care what my wife thinks about me as a husband. I care what my children think about me as a father and a grandfather. I care what you think about me as a pastor. I mean, when others ask you, who's your pastor now? It matters to me whether you say, oh, it's Kurt Stadler. And he's really good. His sermons really move me. And, and he seems to care a lot about the people of the church. And, and I believe that he truly loves the Lord. Or whether you say, well, he's a nice man. But what a sleeper in the pulpit. <laughs> Doesn't seem to relate very well to the people of the church or Worst of all, well, he tries. <laughs> Bless his heart. <laughs> and everybody knows what you mean. Well, we got us a dud. <laughs> but thank God we're Methodist, and by June we can get him gone. <laughs> what others think is important, as someone once famous said, no man or woman is an island. <laughs> We live in connection to others. We are part of a community, and the perceptions of others shape us to some degree. Now, now, does this mean we should make decisions solely based on what others think, or that we should compromise internally motivated values based on what others think? No. Because Jesus follows up his first important question with a second question question that is even more important and profound and penetrating. Jesus asks the disciples, who do you say that I am? That is a deeply personal question. To be asked that question conveys a level of trust and a level of responsibility that cannot be taken lightly. That is a look you in the eye. Kind of question. I would ask that question only of those whom I trusted and respected and valued. I would answer that question only to those whom I trusted and respected and valued. To answer that question also means taking on a level of responsibility that comes with being in a personal relationship. Peter is the one who steps forward. And he takes the risk to answer Jesus' question. What do we know about Peter? He was far from perfect. Peter was at times impulsive. And he was at times cowardly. Peter sometimes talked a bigger talk than the walk he could walk. Hmm. But Peter was not afraid to answer the important question. Peter was willing to be vulnerable to, to the risks of relationship. Peter took the risk of opening up his heart to Jesus. You see, that's what being a Christian is all about. I, I agree with Will Willowman when he says, when it comes down to it, what is the one thing that makes Christians Christian? Well, the answer, despite what we might think, is not pop-up dinners. <laughs> it's not WWJD bracelets or pushy preachers. The thing that makes us who we are <coughs> is who Jesus is. Yes. Jesus Christ is Christianity. You see, other faiths have love. They love one another. Other faiths have beliefs about the good and the true. But only Christianity has Jesus. If God had kept aloof from us, if God had only given us a book then we would have the Bible, but we wouldn't be Christians. We would be another noble philosophy or a system of ethical virtues. But what God did, we believe, is to come to us in the flesh as a Jew from Nazareth named Jesus, or more Hebraically named Yeshua, meaning God saves. We believe that the peculiar way God saves 
that God gets us, gets to us, and gets us is through Jesus. It is our astounding claim that we look at the Jewish carpenter's son who was born, who lived very briefly, who died violently in his 30s and rose from the dead unexpectedly. And in that one individual, in that one man, we see as much of God Almighty as we'll ever hope to see. Now, we can sympathize with folks who look at Jesus and see only a noble teacher, or only a great moral example, or even a wild-eyed revolutionary. After all, from the very beginning, who Jesus was and what he was about was far from self-evident. There were people who stood face-to-face with Jesus when he walked this earth, and they said, this man is God incarnate. But there were many others who looked at Jesus and said, this man's nuts. One of the reasons some have made, some may have thought Jesus was on, if not over the edge, is his question, who do you say that I am? For it's a direct question. It is a question hard to evade or dance around or remain noncommittal about. It's a direct question requiring a direct answer. Who do you say that I am. Well, there's a great debate about that. Many different theories, all kinds of theological constructs and concepts. Can we have a seminar about it, Jesus? And can we invite in some experts before I give you my answer? No, no, I want to know. Who do you say that I am? Well, my grandmother always said that you were, no, 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 I want to know who you say that I am. Well, you know, I watched an old video of Billy Gra- of a Billy Graham crusade last night, and Billy Graham said, no, no, no. I want to know who you say that I am. It is a direct question, a moment of truth question, a personal accountability question. And Peter, the rock, the man of courage, sometimes more courage than he can live up to, but nonetheless, not one afraid to raise his hand and give an answer, says, you are Christ. (laughs) Peter took the risk of saying to Jesus, I will get close enough to you to answer your question. And I'll let my answer come from my heart. What is truly earth-shaking about this scripture is that Jesus is making the astounding assertion that the God of the universe, the great I Am, is as close to you and me as the one who is sitting next to you in the pew this morning, or the one with whom you are invited to share a meal in just a few moments. There's another place later in Matthew's Gospel where Jesus takes on the question, Another question, and this question is, in the end, what matters most? When we stand before God on that final day of judgment, what question will we be asked? And Jesus' answer surprised those who first heard it and continues to surprise folks today. Fred Craddock, who's one of my favorite preachers, summarizes that story from Matthew chapter 25, and he suggests that Jesus' words then and Jesus' words now go something like this. Our final test question is this. Now, here's the question that God will ask. How did you respond to human need? How did you respond to human need? That's it. That's the question we'll be asked. I was alone. I had no one in this world. My husband had died. My children lived in another state, but I stayed in that big empty house. Did you or did you not come to me? I was in prison. I was cut off from society for my misdeeds. I was a criminal. Yes, I was a criminal, but I was still a human being. Did you or did you not come and visit me? I was hungry. I was peering into a world of banquet 
cigarettes and diets, and I saw more food flushed down disposals than my entire family had eaten. Did you offer me anything to eat? I was without clothing. I was looking into the shop windows, gazing at the wardrobes of the world, and I waited for styles to change, hoping for an old coat or dress. Did you offer me anything to wear? I was a stranger. I was new at the job. I was new in the city. I was new on the streets. I was new in the neighborhood. I was new in the apartment building. I did not know a soul. Did you introduce yourself to me? That's Jesus. Moved by this final scene and feeling the burden of that one question, Christian leaders centuries ago made a list of sins. And at the top of that list, they placed what they called the seven deadly sins. Sins so scaly and serpentine as to destroy a person completely. And in the list of those seven deadly sins is included Acadia. It's a Greek word. And it's a word which means I don't care. That's one of the seven dead sins. I don't care. When everything is over and the streets have been rolled up, when all the switches have been thrown and everything we have been doing has been done for the last time, the Creator and Judge, <coughs> Fred Credit says, the Creator and Judge will call the world to account with this one question. How did you respond to human beings? That question and the one question Jesus puts to his disciples in our scripture this morning just may be two sides of one coin. For how can we answer one and not answer the other? For the God we meet in this man is up close and personal. He's as close as the person sitting next to you and in front of you and behind you. God, we meet in this man is teaching us how to love each other and how to forgive and receive forgiveness. One more story before we go eat. In my study this week, I read a story about a woman who was very alone, very ill. She was at home dying of AIDS. It would be hard to overstate how depressed and discouraged she was feeling. A friend was so concerned about her that this friend called a priest to come by and visit the woman. Now that doesn't always help, but in this case it did. The woman candidly told the priest, look, I've made such a mess of my life. I've made so many mistakes. How could God ever forgive me? The priest listened and he said to her, God can forgive anyone, anytime. We just have to trust. We have to receive it. We have to let that forgiveness come close to us. And the woman said, I, I think I'm beyond that. I think I'm beyond believing that that's possible. Well, at that very moment, the priest happened to notice that on the woman's bedroom dresser was a beautiful picture of a young girl. She looked to be maybe 12 years old. And the priest asked the woman, who is that little girl in the picture? And for the first time in the conversation, the woman smiled and she said, oh, that's my daughter. She's the only beautiful thing I have left in my life. And the priest said, and if your daughter made some mistakes and did some things that were wrong and was hurting and broken, wouldn't you forgive her? Wouldn't you come close to her and still love her? Wouldn't you still want her to be in your life? 
And the woman, whispering now, the woman said, Yes. Yes. Of course. Yes. And then that priest made a wonderfully astute theological connection. He said, I want you to know that God has a picture of you on his dresser. And God still loves you. And you are not alone. Who is this God we come here to meet this morning? Could it be that he has your picture? On his dresser. And even if you have been on the run from him, even if you have been off in some other state, some far country, maybe it's time to come home. Come to the moment of truth. Face your demons, knowing that he's with you. In all of his almighty power, he's right there beside you. Maybe you've been adrift on a far shore, and it's time. for one another.